what the Apostle Paul said. None of these things move me. None of these things take my focus away from Jesus. None of these things stop me from running my race. I'm going to finish this race. And nothing is going to distract me. And now we have to understand Paul is on this level of faith. He's on a real high level of faith. And we, we read that and we say, that's what we want to do. But it's going to take a journey to get to that place where nothing moves us. But we're on this journey, amen. We're doing better. We're growing. We're maturing. Amen. Sometimes there's Christians that it might take them four days to, hang, to say, hang on a minute. Why am I being moved by this? I'm a believer. It takes us four days. Some might take two weeks. Now, the idea is that it takes two seconds, two minutes. Yes, because the first, the first uh, place that the devil hits us is our flesh. So we see it, we hear it, and of course, we're going to feel it in our flesh. And it might take us a while to process it and say, hang on a minute, I'm not going to allow my flesh or my, my senses my feelings to dictate, amen, how I'm going to react to this situation. That, that might take, depending on our journey with God, it might take time. But the idea is, is that the time gets shorter and shorter and shorter as we grow in the things of God. Amen? The Apostle Paul said, you're no longer children. Amen? Be, be adult, be mature. Let's grow. And there's no greater place of showing our maturity in our reactions in our reactions. So that's, that's the idea and understanding that we are, we are in a spiritual warfare. We are in a spiritual warfare and to try to pretend that we're not, to try to be very casual about it and what, what the church tries to do so much today, tries to make it like everything's okay, nothing's wrong, you know, just there's, there's no opposition. That's, that's to live in Nala land. We are in a spiritual warfare and the devil is continually trying to move us from our place in Christ. And he uses the gate of our thinking. He uses our mind. He, he tries to create strongholds in our minds through, through what happens out here. And so last uh, Sunday we spoke about that, that we, we have to understand in verse 4 of chapter 10 in 2 Corinthians, says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So there's weapons. And what do we do with the weapons? We cast down arguments. We cast down imaginations. We cast down philosophies. We cast down false doctrine, opinions that are anti-God. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, can I ask you a question? What is the ultimate knowledge of God? What is the greatest knowledge of God? What, what do we know to be the knowledge of God, practically? What do you think? For the sake of time, this. This is the knowledge of God. Do you want to know what God thinks about something? Go to the book. Go to the Bible. So he's saying, anything that exalts itself against this, bring it down. Amen. Cast it down. Destroy it. If the world says it and God says contrary, we cast down what the world says. Anything that tries to exalt itself and tries to override God's opinion, we've got to cast it down. Anything that tries to say, like the, like the serpent said to Eve, has God said? Does God really mean we have to adapt God's knowledge, God's word to the culture. Any, any, any language like that, we've got to cast it down quickly before it starts to entertain us and we begin to think about it. And now it becomes a stronghold because we didn't cast it down. Now, society out there has, has been allowing for the last 40 years for opinion to shift. Amen? Amen? Society has allowed moral values to shift. And we're going, to look, we're going to look at where it has shifted. It's shifted to the demonic powers that are in the air. The arguments, arguments that have been, have been bombarding moral values. 
Amen. To where today we are in a place where we've got all this funny stuff going on. It's not funny, it's, but it, it, it is. But, you know, where gender debates, where, you know, you choose what you want to be. You're a boy, but you can choose if you want to be a girl. Or some other thing that they're trying to bring out, you know. Laws. Marriage laws. Um, family laws. The dad and the mum no longer can run the home because the child is in, is in charge. We want modern parents. Well, it exalts itself against the word. Mis, mismatch or wrong, wrong roles, husband and wife. Wrong roles, changing the roles. It's all, it, it all exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God tells a father and a mother how to discipline their children, how to, how to bring up their children. And the world says, no, you don't do it like that. It's exalting itself against the knowledge of God. We entertain, we, we entertain what the world says about how to do it through Oprah, through Dr. Phil. And, and we go, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the five minutes in the corner sounds better. It might sound bad. It might do the job, but it's not the Bible. I know what I know what is better. Amen. And so the world is gone. But this is the problem now. Now there's a, now there's this the last ten years I would say where it's been bombarding the church. And now in the church. We have the world. In the church, the church is shifting. The church is compromising. The church is reevaluating long held doctrines, long held moral values. Where you would ask a pastor 40 years ago, what do you think? And he'll tell you smack bam in the middle of your face what he thought because of the Bible. Today, a pastor squirms around in his seat because he doesn't want to say what God's word says. Because he doesn't want to be looked at as a bigot and as old-fashioned and as fundamentalist and as a fanatic. Afraid. Afraid of the pop culture. Afraid of public opinion. Blessed, we should have a fear, a godly fear of God's opinion. Hallelujah. What does God's knowledge say about this? And, and, and really, really, church, it's a casting down that we've got to do. It, it, is a, it is a pulling down strongholds. It's coming into our home. It's coming in through the television. It's coming in through the, through the education system. It's coming in through the politics, and behind it all is our demonic powers. This is not a picnic in the park, Fruit Loop cereal, everything's okay, nothing's wrong, there's nothing bad. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a warfare going on for the heart of the nation and for the church. Where we cannot play with this. We cannot compromise with this, sit on a table and try to negotiate with the enemy and try to, um, try to change God's word for the word of the culture. And that's what happens in Romans chapter 1. It says, they changed the truth for a lie and they worshiped the creature more than the creator. And then keep reading that, and there's, that's a chapter that not many people want to read. So he, so he gave them over to, to do what they wanted, man with man, woman with woman, doing those things which are unnatural, burning in their lusts. The, 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 the world has accepted it, but now it's creeping into the church. And if you want to bind... And if you want to cast, and if you want to be radical, you want to destroy strongholds, and you say, we're not going to have any part of that, you're going to be looked at, we are going to be looked at as fundamentalists. Yes, I'm a fundamentalist. I fundamentally believe 
God's Word. Come on, church. Say amen. See, we're scared to say fundamentalist today or say radical Christianity because we're scared that it's going to put us in the same box as Islam. Because a fundamentalist Islamic or a a radical Muslim, we know what they do. So then we, we, we want to be careful to not be looked as fundamentalists. So in, in that trying to be relevant, we are changing God's truth for a lie. In, in, now, now, now we, we can, people can criticize the church of 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago that they were uneducated and, and they, they, they didn't have the, the music of today or they didn't have the auditorium, they were from the poor of society, but there's one thing about those believers, they stood up for something. Oh, wow. They stood up for something. You you knew when evangelist so-and-so was coming to town, you knew he was coming to town. He was coming to preach the Word of God. Come on, hallelujah. You knew where the church was. You knew what the church believed. You knew what, what the church stood up for. Today. What has happened? What has happened? And Christian homes today, it's just the same as the home of the world. We've got the same books, the same music, the same language, the same everything goes. But it it started because we stopped. First of all, let me backtrack. We didn't think we were in a warfare. We didn't know what the weapons are. And so we cannot cast down and, and destroy strongholds when we see them trying to come. Now, again, I said last one, oh, pastor, well, then we've got to go and live in the cave. Like someone said to my wife once, oh, we have to, we have to go and live in the cave. Then that's what, No, 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 we don't have to go and live in the cave. we just got to be like the book of Acts, church, take a stand. Let the light shine. The light has to shine in darkness. The salt has to be out there to give flavor to the world. Amen. So we have to understand And if you don't understand it, if you don't understand it like Eve didn't understand that she was in a warfare when she was talking to the serpent, you don't understand it, then eventually you eat of the forbidden fruit. You eat of the fruit that is prohibited by God. You you partake of something that you once were strongly against. But what's the what is the pattern? It's a talking, it's a it's trying to change, change the mindset. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says, The serpent was crafty and subtle, and he corrupted the mind of Eve. Here. So instead of going, Oh, yeah, everything's okay. Yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no we can't be that radical. Yeah, God, this is what God thought. No, no, it's not that God's against it. It's that God was, that was that time. It was a cultural thing. And so we talk and we talk and we talk. Don't be so rad. We, don't have, we, can, we can watch some things. We, we, can, we can go there as long as we witness. So we start compromising. And then before we know it, now we're in it just completely to where it's okay. So we need to understand we're in a spiritual warfare. We need to not be passive about this. And is what we're going to look at this morning. And, and, and I'm, I'm not going to finish today, that's for sure. But we need to understand the weapons that God has given to us. Why would, the, why would the Apostle Paul talk about weapons and spiritual warfare and then just leave us without knowing what the weapons are? And if he talks about weapons, weapons are there to be used. Every father can use them. Every mother can use them. Like, so you, you, father and mother, you better fight for your children or the world will fight for them. Amen. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. And we'll just take this slowly today and the next week and because I, I would really like us to understand what weapons do we have? What can we do against this? 
that's coming our way and be used by God to cast down and to destroy imaginations and strongholds that come against the knowledge of God. And I love the last part there. I didn't read it now, but it says, and bringing every thought into captivity. I love that. I could preach on that all morning. You put something captive in a, in a warfare, in a war sense, you put prisoners of war into captivity, don't you? And a prisoner of war, when they put him into captivity, what do they do? They interrogate them. They want to find out where did you come from? Why have you come here? Who is your leader? Where are the weapons? And if, and if the, the answer is not good, they'll leave them in prison or they might even kill them. Now, and again, do you understand the terminology? Paul's saying, bring, bring every thought into captivity to the anointing of Christ. What he's saying is this. You, you thoughts that, are, that you're not sure about, bring them captive. Interrogate them. Interrogate the thoughts. Why are they saying that? Why, why, why did they give me that perspective? What doctrine have I just heard? Interrogate thoughts. Interrogate doctrines. Interrogate opinions. Find out why have you come to my mind? Have you come to bless me or have you come to hurt me? Should I, hallelujah. You put them captive. Say, I'm not going to allow you to live in my head unless you tell me why you've come. Oh, hallelujah. And then when you find out that, they've, that, that that word was sent to you from your friend to, to cause you to have strife and to offend you and to hurt you, you tell that thought, I'm not just going to keep you captive. I'm going to give you a death sentence. Get out of my head now. There's things that I've heard, even doctrinally, things that I hear, and I put them captive. I say, I'll, I'll interrogate. I'll, I'll study it. I'll, I'll find out, is that from God? You don't swallow everything. You don't swallow everything. You don't just swallow things just because people tell you they say it's true. You interrogate the thought. You put it captive to the anointing, to Christ, and you find out, is it from God or is it from the enemy? Does it need to be destroyed or can it be let loose in my head? Come on. Okay, so now we go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Now, we're talking here again about warfare. The Apostle Paul says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How many of you know that God's got a lot of might behind him? If you say, you know, the power of America, oh, you know, you got the greatest, you have the greatest army in the world right there, the most powerful army in the world. The might of America. Well, how many of you know that God has a lot of might behind him? It's not by power, it's not by might but by my spirit, says the Lord. So you be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What do we do? Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stop there. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Why? Why? What for? Why do I have to put on the armor of God? So everyone can see I'm a Christian? Why do I have to put on the armor of God? The Apostle Paul says, because so you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh-oh, there's a devil, and he's not your husband. He's not the politician that you don't like. Put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, so there's a devil, and what's the devil doing? Is he out there just having a, waiting for the millennium to start? Is he out there just waiting for us to go in the rapture? No, no. The wiles of the enemy. Wiles of the devil. So you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Everybody say wiles. The word wiles literally means the trickery. The strategy, amen, the craftiness of the devil. The devil is crafty, he is tricky, and he is subtle. So you put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against his craftiness. Eve didn't understand this. Uh, 
her husband, what's his name? Adam, didn't want anything to do with it. Like a lot of the church today. No, we don't want to believe there's a warfare. We're having fun. But the wiles of the enemy. Another, another verse says, we are not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. God does not want us ignorant of the devil's devices, his strategies, his trickery. The Bible will tell us how he tricks us. Again, through the mind. So you put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the strategies of the enemy. We better be alert how he comes to strategize against our home. We better be alert how he comes to strategize against our marriage, against our children. One of the things that I'm seeing today, and, and I'm observing it for, for a long time now, is that parents are not fighting for their kids. Hey, 14 years old, you're the boss. Even 19. Until they get married. What's this? The guy's 12 years old telling dad and mom no. And the dad and mom, oh, don't hurt little Johnny. Don't, don't upset him. Are, are we kidding? Is that like, do we look like a general? Do we look like a soldier in the army of God? And, and we don't understand the strategies. Amen? What they're watching. Oh, I, this phone is getting me, it's getting on my nerves. This here, the kids love it. I don't know what we've got to do with this, eh? We, have, we should have a bonfire one Sunday morning. Everyone bring their phones, their children's phone, throw it in here. Oh, the kids are going, oh, no, daddy, no way, don't do that. We better be alert. I was listening to a pastor this week. It's a world-renowned renowned evangelist, powerful preacher of the gospel. World-renowned. If I said his name, some of you wouldn't know. Maybe most of you wouldn't. But he was talking about how, he was talking about this kind of thing, spiritual warfare and 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 understanding the trickery of the devil, he'll come under your nose, into your home. And he says, my daughter was 11 years old, 11 years old. She's 17 years old now. And she gave a testimony at the youth group. And she said, daddy and mommy, my testimony today is going to shock you. I've never told you, but I just want you to know that today I'm, 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 I'm born again. I'm free. I've been set free by God. He says, when my daughter got up there to give a testimony, she began to say, from the, late, from the age of 11, 12, 13, I think it was 14, she was hooked on pornography. And she said she got hooked on the phone in her bedroom. The dad says, I never even knew that was going on. Young, the strategies of the enemy. We're living in a culture now where the devil can just come in so subtly that we don't even know. But for me, now, we cannot judge because we're, hey, we're all, we're all up against this. But how a, a father and a mother for, for such a long period of time cannot see or observe the strategies of the enemy that's, that's going on. That tells me there's a bit of a disconnect. Father, you get, in, you get involved, and even with that, they're going to do things. Even with your strict, and with your, that's not going to happen here, you, get, you sometimes get a bit of egg on your face. Hey, what can we do? What can we do? Someone said there's always, you know, hey, if I was to tell you some of the greatest evangelists ever, their kids have messed up. And you go, how did that happen? It's, but it doesn't make it right. But it's still... It's warfare. It's warfare. Amen. You look at Billy Graham. Have a look at it. What's happened with what happened to him with his T D Jakes. Read their biography. I've read their biography. It's amazing. Because it's warfare. And I think the, the, the higher you go, I think the warfare gets stronger. So you pray for your pastors. You pray for the evangelists. You pray for the preachers. Amen. 
Pray for your husband. Pray for, your, pray for one another. Pray for your children against the strategies of the enemy. Men, protect yourself against the strategies of the enemy. Women, protect yourself against the, dis- the cunningness and the subtlety of the enemy that comes to put a thought in your head. We're in a warfare. I, I'm not glorifying the enemy. I'm not glorifying the devil, but there is one. And he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Someone says, I don't know how that happened. We do know. Some, it's, a, it's a warfare. It's a strategy. It's a thought. And we don't bind it and we don't cast it. We don't get help. Amen. Such a wonderful thing to say, brother, can you pray with me together? Two are better than one. I'm battling with this. I'm up against it right now. I need some heavy artillery. Come on. I need someone to come alongside me and help me against the wiles of the enemy that are coming against my life, against my marriage, against my home, against my church. Come on. Let's stand together and let's believe for victory in this thing. Hallelujah. As opposed, as opposed to saying, well, no, it'll turn out well. It, it, it'll, it'll, it'll change eventually. Or someone will lay hands on my head and it'll just go in Jesus' name. And, and, and just being casual about it. Church, we are in a warfare. And the devil is cunning and we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. Everyone, James says, everyone has a button. James says, everyone is enticed. Amen. By whatever it is that he, he or she is struggling with or dealing with on the inside. Everyone has a button. And guess what? The devil does his research. Because I'm going to show you later on, and, and again, because of lack of time, we're going to look at the, there's four levels of, of principalities. Four levels. Amen. It, the devil does his research. And that's why he'll attack us always on that side, through that side, through that, through that area. And so we need, to, we need to fight. Amen. We need to protect our minds. We need to get around the right people, read the right things, feed, feed ourselves with God's knowledge, God's word. The more you have God's word on the inside of you, the less of the devil's word you're going to hear. Amen. So we need to understand that we are in a warfare against the, the trickery, the trickery of the devil. The, the devil was so trick. He tried to get Jesus. Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command that that mountain be turned into bread. Jesus was hungry. Tricky. He comes. But hey, Jesus took out the sword and he just chopped the devil up. Hallelujah. But he came back three times. The Apostle Paul. Let's keep reading here. For we do not wrestle. Oh, we wrestle, do we? We wrestle against flesh and blood. I don't wrestle against my brother. No, 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 no. I don't wrestle against you. I don't even wrestle against my enemies. If I have any. I don't have any. I don't don't wrestle against people. See, when you know this, then you understand it's not the people, it's not the person, it's the spirit behind that person. And the Apostle Paul knew it. You know why? One day in Acts chapter 17, there's a woman following him around and saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. And the Bible says she did this under a demonic spirit, which is the lowest level, we're going to look at next week, the lowest level of demonic powers are demons. Demons, they're the henchmen. They're the hitmen. They go and they, and they do what the principalities tell them to do and the, and the, and the powers. And she was demon-possessed with a demon of, of trickery, false, trying to discredit Paul, trying to annoy Paul. And every day she would follow Paul. These men are the servants of the Most High God. She was using, she was using uh, sorcery, manipulation, and I love what the word says in English. It says, and Paul, getting greatly annoyed, 
on, on a certain day, must have been four or five days later, who knows how many days, but on that day, Paul said, I've had enough of this woman. Sometimes you've got to have enough of people following you around. Amen. And there comes a time where you let them, but then there comes a time to say, okay, enough. And he turned around. Now, here's the key. And he told the spirit, not her. He told the spirit. He commanded the spirit to get out of the woman. He dealt with the root issue, the spirit to get out of the woman. Now, again, there's so much teaching in this. Not everything is spiritual. Not everything is demonic because some people blame the devil for everything. It's just them, character, habits, upbringing. They don't want to change. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. But there are some things that are demonic. And Paul knew it. And he says, I command you, foul spirit, get out of her. And the spirit left her that very hour. Demonic spirits. Amen. Let's keep reading. How long do we have to go? Two minutes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. No, I'm not going to fight you. We don't wrestle. But we wrestle. Like, so we wrestle against principalities. Everybody say principalities. That's number one. We're going to look at that next week. I've got no time now to do that. Against powers. Number two. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age. That's number three. And then there comes the demons. Look at this. And against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's demonic powers. Demons. That, are, that go forth and they do what the principalities and the, that, the word rulers of the darkness of this age. That has to do with that rulers changing laws. Rulers, authorities of darkness. The word darkness is uh, sin, wickedness, evil. So a lot... Much of what is going on today is as a direct influence of these rulers of the darkness, amen, of the darkness of this world. That's why you see laws changing. That's demonic. It's actually come that the enemy has a structure in his hierarchy. Principalities are the, are the highest level of demonic powers. Actually, I was reading a commentary, and I think they're right. The principalities are actually the fallen angels. The fallen angels, they are the chiefs, they are the leaders, they are the, they are the commanders, they sit and give orders. Then you have the powers, that's, that's the power to influence under them. Then you have these rulers of the darkness of the world, the ones that go and try to implement it. In, not just in the average, but they go to, they go to the high, highest level of the land. Politics, the laws, the courts, the education. And they start to work on people. And then they, and they try to work on religious leaders. Amen. And then the demons are the, are the, are the lowest level. They're the, they're the henchmen. They're the, they're the, they're the um, what, are you, what that, that word that they use in the mafia? Sicario. Oh, the... The hitmen, they're the ones, there are, there are demons of sickness, there are demons of divorce, there are demons of, of, of disunity, there are demons of cancer, there are, de there are demons that are specifically instructed to go and do certain things. I'm sorry that I'm talking about the devil but we've got to. And then understand that we have been given weapons. And my time is right now. We'll get there next week. But listen, there are weapons at our disposal. And I'm going to give them to you because I want, I want you to think about they're there. There's three. Are you ready? We have three weapons. Number one, number one is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. The armor of God is all, it's a, it's a protective weapon. So you put the breastplate, the, the, the shoes, that's not to, you don't fight with that, that's to defend, protect you. But there's three offensive weapons. Number one, the shield of faith. The shield is not only to protect you, but they would use, I'm going to show you next week, the Roman soldiers at that time, their shield was like a door, was bigger than themselves, and they would use it also to fight with it.
to push back. Everybody say push back. It's time to push back. They would push back the enemy when they would fight with the shield of faith. So we're going to look at faith. Faith is a weapon. Number two, everybody say sword. The sword of the Spirit. A sword is given to be used. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. But it's not just any word. It's an anointed word. It's an anointed word. You're going to get, God's going to anoint you. When words come out of your mouth in front of a situation, it's what David did to Goliath. You know that Goliath didn't die because David whacked him in the middle of the head with a stone? No, no. David killed him before. He took out the sword of the Spirit and he said, Today, no, no, today I'm going to cut your head off. You've defied the armies. Of, see, that's words. That's the sword. There's an anointing, something that comes on you. Not every word you say is anointed. If I say later on, I want to go and have lunch, that's not anointed. I oh, I just felt that. Hallelujah. Ooh, I want to go and have lunch. I felt that. No. But when the enemy comes into your home and you get up and you say, I'm not going to have that. Um, I claim the promises of God and I will not allow that to come into my home. Devil, your days are numbered. Get out of here. And you say that under anointing. The sword, pa, 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 you start cutting. And the last one is, we're going to look at these in detail in the next few weeks. The last one is, and this is for me, for me, one of the most powerful. Tongues. It says there, above all these things, praying in the Spirit. When the battle intensifies and you pray in tongues, whoa, that's a weapon that the enemy does not want to be around. That Someone said, tongues is a weapon of mass destruction. Those of you that were there on Tuesday night, what happened when we started praying in tongues, everyone? What did you sense? What did you feel? There was a change in the atmosphere. Wasn't it, Brother Ben? Powerful. May God help us. At the end of the day, if we're in Christ Jesus, we're more powerful than anything the devil can do. But we need to know our weapons. Otherwise, we're like, if, 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 if uh, the general of the Australian army said, hey, boys, Boys and girls, I'm sending you to Iraq. And they've had no training. I'm sending you to Iraq because you, you, you registered. You became a Christian. You became a, you became a soldier in the Army of Australia. We're sending, we're sending you to Iraq. Just remember, we love you. Just remember that when you're up against the battles and, and the artillery, of the, just, just remember, we love you. Everything's going to be all right. It's okay. God loves you. I, we love you. Just remember, we love you. Just, when, when you're up against that battle, stand up and say, I'm a citizen of Australia. That's all you've got to do. Just, just stand up and declare, I am a citizen of Australia. I'm a soldier in the army of Australia. What are they going to do? Pull out of here. See? No, no, they tell them. This weapon... They tell them this, this here is a grenade. They tell them this tank can do this. This is how you use it. Now they've got drones now. We have a drone as well. So what we're doing in the body of Christ, pastors are responsible for this because we're supposed to train our people. But we're saying, he loves you. We know he loves us. But what do we do? How do we pick up the weapon? How do we use the weapon? What do I do when it comes against my marriage, against my children, against my city, against the nation, against the church? What do we do? We have weapons. Faith, the Word of God, tongues. Let's all stand up this morning.